Dawkers. <laughs> cool. Welcome everybody. We're here with Eddie Dawkins, uh, current world champion, current Olympic silver medalist. He is a current Commonwealth champion. Yep. Yep. He's got the full set of Commonwealth medals. Yeah. A few world silvers. Yeah. Soon to get my first world individual gold, hopefully. Yeah, nice. The gold. Uh, tell everybody out there who's Eddie Dawkins today, mate. Oh, today. I live in Cambridge, but a proud South and boy. Um, I ride my bike for a living and I tinker with, I don't know, motorbikes and tattoos and coffee and lifting weights in my spare time. <laughs> <laughs> Hell of a lifestyle, mate. Um, tell us about what what was Eddie, what was the defining characteristic of Eddie when you were five years old were you at Wahope High School? Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about five-year-old Eddie. <laughs> he was... Well, actually, on my first day at primary school, I got put in the naughty circle, like within the first hour. So <laughs> that didn't go by. You yeah. know, I'm coming off a bad start. I think maybe, but no. Young boy always rode my bike to school. Yeah, I lived stone's throw from my high bike school, so that made it easy. And that's probably why I'm a sprinter because I don't like going too far. <laughs> but um, yeah, just um, yeah. Yeah. What what sort of Find you characteristically. I know you always say you were chubby, but as a person, personality wise, what, what were you like? Do you think? Um, I was eccentric. I, um, I never stood still. I was maybe a little bit ADHD, <laughs> <laughs> undiagnosed. Um, yeah, I loved outside. I playing outside. Um, riding my bike, playing force back in the on the um, on the street with my mates, and yeah, just never never hold me down to like doing. I don't know mundane stuff, i.e. homework and that kind of stuff. So I just, um, yeah, I was a really active kid and, and it sort of flowed on to my career. Nice, mate. And so, did you play football growing up, soccer? I played soccer growing up, yeah, yeah. but I wasn't, I didn't have very good foot-eye coordination, so I never really got many goals, but um, I spent a lot of time in the goalie box, actually. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I remember coming across you on the football field, but then it was... Um, when I was fourth form, you were third form. Um, we, we came together on the volleyball court. Uh, had a fantastic trip along to uh, Christchurch. I think we won the second division. Yeah, beat Aranui. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the underachievers division. It was <laughs> yeah. good, good fun. Um, and I think out of that that tour, we had a little bit of a catchphrase, which drove you and Nathan Wheeler's Young Enterprise scheme. Uh, I think I've still got the little. Little uh, number plate there. Do you want to let everybody know what, what we were immaturely screaming out the windows at people? I can't, cross I can't remember. I've got a pretty poor memory. You'd have to, you'd have to <laughs> remind me and the folks at home. Yeah, so I've got this number plate, and I think you guys sold out as well. Of and on my one, it just says Lusty. And <laughs> <laughs> I remember our, uh, our, our volleyball coach is, is a good man, but uh, quite Christian and. Uh, I think we've got told off quite a few times. It doesn't surprise me at all. Quite a few times. Uh, uh, another promising athlete out of that volleyball team, Big Marshall Hall. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's just been at the World Champs for Discus. Um, what What did you enjoy most about playing volleyball? I know it was a bit of a laugh, and and I think we went on in, in my seventh form year to nationals, and I think we we're in Division Eight or something like that. And, we managed to win that, but what did, what did you enjoy most about volleyball, mate? Oh, it was cool. It was like, a, like I love the team aspect of it, you know, and like hitting the ball as hard as you can at somebody, you know, like assault by volleyball is, is <laughs> was one of the main draws for me coming in the volleyball. But like, I love love the team aspect of it and, and traveling as well with the team, and yeah, it just it was cool to like I don't know spend time with the boys and and just get up to mischief. <laughs> No, it's, it's all very good. So, um, now you ride bikes for a living. Uh, what was your introduction to cycling? Um, my introduction to cycling in a racing sense was, I used to play rugby with this guy called Blair Shirley. Yeah. One of my really close friends from Chicago. And I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure he's responsible for me falling off a bike on some chips here, which <laughs> It doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> Um, but me and him did, did a lot of sports together, played rugby together and that, and one day he wasn't at rugby, I was like, I went to his house, he lived across the street, I was like, why weren't you at rugby today? He's like, oh, I was at the track, I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so the next day we went down to the velodrome and I was hooked, you know, like, 
went down to the Q Bowl, sadly not there now, but um, played around on the bikes and, and Laurie Tall was our coach and he and he's still coaching to this day and and um, had a blast, man, and I loved it and, and it came a time when mum and dad told me it was rugby or cycling and well, the rest speaks for itself, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Um, and I, I dabbled in a little bit of cycling and said I think Lee was responsible for knocking me off a bike, but Laurie Tall, he said uh, when you on the track, he's quick to identify people and quick to encourage people. What do you think special about Laurie that you know he turns out so many good good cyclists out of a small town like Invercargill? I think he just listens, yeah, he listens to them, and he like I don't know, he makes cycling fun as well. You know, like cycling is, is a is a job for people at the higher level, but like it's you've got to you've got to enjoy what you're doing, and, and he made it fun and and he sort of saw like what your capabilities were. And but the funny thing was, is for my whole career, like from that very first day to the present day, he would tell me that I was born on a man's mission. <laughs> like even now, and and he said I would have been a great like team pursuit rider, and I don't know. I think he might have missed the mark on that one. <laughs> <laughs> nice, bro. Um, so, who do you think? Solidifies a really good sprinter, but they're not set up. For that. You know, if you were to look at them on the street, they're not set up for that. Is there anybody in, in elite sprinting that it doesn't match fit the mold? Yeah, there's a few. So there's like you've got your extreme sides. So you've got this guy called Robert Forsman who lives in, in Germany, and he's he's a bodybuilder pretty much. <laughs> you know, like he's the guy that everyone says to the biggest leads in cycling, and he's like a little short guy, he's super wide, super ripped, and it just doesn't make sense that he would ride a bike. And then you've got really small guys like Azazul Wang from Malaysia, who's the current Kieran World Champion, and he looks like a little boy, <laughs> but he's an absolute machine. And then you've got the extremes like um, Peralta from Spain, who is six, six foot six or something, and it doesn't make sense for him to be on a bike. You know, he should be playing volleyball, but he's, um, he's a machine on the machine on the bike. And I think that cycling with the Aid of different size bikes and that kind of stuff, you can account for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, what do you think is the most important skill then? If so many different people can get on a bike and be great, what's the most important skill do you think for winning a winning a race? Say in in uh, individual sprint versus gear. Um, the whole the bread and butter is power to weight really, and then it's followed closely by aerodynamics. So, if your power to weight is high, no matter how Big you are, how small you are. If your watts you can produce per kilogram is higher than the next guy, then you're going to outrun them over a short distance. And the aerodynamics comes into play, lengthening that speed out. So, in the sprint, it's ideal to have power to weight, huge power to weight. And in the Karen, the power to weight is less important because you're already moving. So the idea is to be more aerodynamic. So you see the guys tucking in real low. It used to be argy bargy and your elbow and stuff, but people just don't do that anymore because it slows you down. Yeah, nice. And then how does those two events translate into the team sprint, which, of course, you're the world champion at? Yeah, it's, uh, power to weight, those two things are the, are the key. The third thing is working well as a unit. So the power to weight gets us all off the line quickly together, where Ethan is the fastest man in the world. So it's hard keeping up with him. <laughs> and then once that's happened... Aerodynamics plays a huge role in sustaining that speed, but the biggest thing that we have over the rest of the world is we work well, we work very well as a three, as yeah. a unit. I've spent my whole career following Sam, <laughs> you know, and Sam's followed Ethan's whole career, so we know how each other moves on the track, we know how close we can be, and if you look at videos of us compared to other nations, it's dialed in perfectly. So we may not be the physical specimens of some other countries. But we do have the best team sprint technically as well. Nice. Um, without giving away any secrets to the rest of the world, probably not that the rest of the world is listening to us just yet, but um, yeah. what's, what's, what's the key to training for you lads? Uh, I saw you, you guys put up some Facebook videos, uh, sorry, Instagram videos the other day sitting around, um, and then there was another one of two sets of bikes. What, what, was, what was going on there, mate? Hard work and, and flushing it out or...? Yeah, well, being a sprinter, it's it's dubbed this this bad bad uh, image of being lazy. <laughs> you spend a lot of time sitting around, and um, 
but that's to get the most out of the recovery. So it's 100% effort on the track, and then it's we rest, we completely rest. We don't we don't move around. We don't you know. So you have to make the most of every amount of time you've got resting, so that the next effort can be as good as the last one. So even though we sit around a lot, we do um, yeah, we do give it heaps on the track. Yeah, and then into the gym, you just straight power or strength or yeah, um, it's a, it's a combination of the both. Um, how strong do you really need to be? Yeah. Do you need to squat three times or whatever? I don't think so. I don't think you need to, but I would love to be able to do it. <laughs> but power is the is the key. Power transfers to the track better than strength does. Yeah. We can train strength purely on the track as well, but we, the power gains in the gym are what really produce the power gains on the track. Nice mate. And so, obviously there's the training side of life, how do you, how do you balance that out? Firstly, um, with your nutrition, what, what sort of parameters does, does New Zealand cycling set for you there? Um, it used to be very strict. Yeah. It used to be, we eat this and we eat this and you have to write down all your food and all that kind of stuff, but I've been riding my bike professionally for the last 15 years. Yeah. So, it's, well, the last 10 years in the elite program and it sort of comes down to a bit of common sense, you know? Like, every now and again you can, I don't know, have a pizza or like, you know, go out for dinner and get a burger instead of a salad or whatever that kind of stuff, but it's just common sense stuff and it's just proteins and carbs and fats and getting the right amount of each one and fueling after training, fueling before training. Nice. Now, I spoke with uh, Tony Dodds last week and he said his life re revolves around his food and his training and the food for the training. Is that similar to you, mate? Yeah, well, Tony Dodds is a, is a different beast altogether. He just wishes he was as strong as me. <laughs> next time you see him, anybody out there, next time you see him, tell him. <laughs> but um, it does, it does. It's, there are foods that you shouldn't eat yeah. before training and after training. Like, for example, I was um, down to the car a while back, and I was talking to a guy that owns a bike shop down there, and he's, I told him about this time, he used to run spin classes, and I would go and do a spin class. One day I ate a pizza before I went to the spin class and then spewed it up. Mm. Like, and it's just like, we have a big laugh over it, but like it's, that kind of stuff would just never happen now, you know? So I would, I would, I would consider having just basic foods before training, and then you can sort of master chef it up in the afternoon. But before training, it's just getting the, the proper nutrients in. I should get, get it up on Instagram. Yeah, well, well, my wife actually told me to stop putting my meals <laughs> on Instagram because no one wants to see it. Oh, no, I don't enjoy it. Um, there's one, there's one person that enjoys it. Yeah, that's no, good. Now we've got the, the two bikes over there. We'll start with the the big beast. What is it about Harley Davidson? Do you make do you have the tattoo? <laughs> no, I don't have the tattoo, no. Um Harley Davidson is oh it's just unreal. Eh? Like if you haven't had a motorbike and if you haven't had the chance to ride on a motorbike, you wouldn't understand like the the feel it is to be like out like no seatbelt, no car around you, you know, going flat out, and just, um, it's very, it's very freeing, you know, yeah. and I love getting out and sort of exploring, like, the Waipa region, and because I'm not from here, I don't, I choose specific roads because I ride just for training, you know, I know the loops and that kind of stuff, but on the mobile, I can venture further and go out further and see a bit more of this countryside. Nice, mate, and then this little thing, yeah. what's, what's, what's the deal, a uh, sewing so, so machine or a, a scooter? <laughs> Scooter driving a pedal bike. What's yeah, that, what's that then? well, it's a um, it's a replica board tracker. So when Harley Davidson first became a motorcycle company, they built motors onto bicycles. Yeah, and this is a this is a replica of that of that sort of setup with um made by a company and or made by a shop in Auckland called T White's Bikes and and it is sort of just I don't know to pay homage to the to the start of Harley Davidson, and it's cool because it's like, it's weird and it's alternative and it's retro and vintage and, and no one in Cambridge has seen one and I haven't seen one in New Zealand, you know, so it's cool to have something that's that's a bit left field and, and um, turns a few heads. Nice, mate. Um, and so, your Harley's not necessarily your speed bike, but it's your, your power bike, because do you think, do you think that personifies sprinters as well? Still speed, but lots of power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's more torque, you know, like, <laughs> it's all torque, but it's a, no, it's a big engine, 1800cc, and I feel like I'm a bit like that, like, 
got heaps of power, but I've got a bigger frame than most. And um, once it's going, you know, it's, it's unstoppable, but it's not a sports bike. I'm not nipping, nipping all over the show. But... <laughs> no feet to pull on. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool, man. So we're, we're sitting in, in the gym. Dawkins performance, he's got yeah. the t-shirt on, I've got one myself, but yeah. happily posting that around on, on Stag Vision. Yeah. Uh, why did you decide to start Dawkins performance and um, tell us a little bit about your uh, studies down in Invercargill that, that lead to such a, such a thing, mate? Yeah, well, I'll start off at the beginning, and so I finished high school, James Huggins College, and I was riding my bike a lot then, and, and I needed to stay near the velodrome. The velodrome had just been built in 2006. And I didn't want to move to Dunedin or to Christchurch or wherever and, and go to uni and, and fall behind on training and lose that that um, facility. So I decided to stay in, in Invercargill and go to SIT. And my gym coach at the time was also a tutor, so that was probably forced upon me a little <laughs> bit. But um, I studied Bachelor of um, Sports Science and I'm one paper away from finishing it, so yeah. mum's on the case, but <laughs> it's sort of led me, led me along this path where I can put my theoretical knowledge and also this decade of physical knowledge, like practical knowledge, into helping others to be bigger and faster and stronger. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, what, what are sort of the client bases that you've been getting at the moment? Uh, at the moment, it's a couple of different ones. Um, Masters track riders are a big, they love it, eh? they just want to be bigger and stronger than their mates, and, <laughs> and, and it's perfect, you know, because they, they work hard and they're pretty green to it. Most Masters riders have never lifted weights in their life, or when they were back in their 20s, you know, like, so they're coming back to it, so it's cool to see where they were and see how far they can get past where they were when they were in their prime, you know, yeah. like, and that's awesome. And the other side is quite unique, it's, um, it's BMX kids, yeah. you know, they're full of energy and they're so powerful, man, so powerful. There's, um, for example, I've got this this little girl that comes and trains and she can almost bench press her body weight, <laughs> which which most men that I know probably can't do. So, uh, nice. yeah, so it's um, it's pretty awesome. It's, it's so, so different as well because you have to be so careful with the, with, the, with the children and the way that they lift and you have to make sure that their technique's perfect and stuff. And if you turn your back on the Masters guys, they just try and lift as much as they can, so you need to watch them as well. There's kind of kids at both ends, really. <laughs> yeah. Nice, mate. Um, so what, when it comes to training for sprint, what do you think is the biggest thing that's wasted out there in terms of training? What are people doing that you, you look at and think that there's no place for that in sprint training? Um, I know it's hard to say because you've got like – different perspectives so like our coach Anthony Peden is uh very much into doing road rides and building up that base fitness but you see a lot of other nations that won't ride their bike road bike at all don't even have a road bike and then you've got guys that spend all their time riding monster gears on the track which is probably the biggest misconception of track cycling is you need to ride massive gears um people are doing similar times now than they were doing 10 years ago and the gears have gone up like a massive amount and they haven't really gotten quicker. So a lot of guys, probably the biggest biggest faux pas in track sprinting for training is riding massive gears all the time. And when they get to a competition, that's all they've got. And if somebody out jumps them or gets the jump on them, there's nothing they can do because they're just grinding away on this big ass gear and it's done, you know. So the biggest, the, the biggest um, misconception is riding massive gears all the time. But we do a lot of varying between tiny gears and and the massive gears, so we sort of yeah kind of cover the whole range. Nice. Um, so I just, before I came here, I searched your name on Wikipedia, and according to Wikipedia, we've got the same stats: one eighty five, ninety six kgs. You don't look at it, I don't think. <laughs> um, but if you were to train me for for a sprint ride for 12, 12 weeks out, what would we focus on? Um, well, it'd probably be cycling technique <laughs> more than anything. I know you're an avid gym goer and you're strong, so I would probably work more on the bike side. But if you were an avid cyclist looking to increase your horsepower, then we'd, we'd work more on the physical stuff in the, in the gym. But for you, I think, yeah, you get on the bike, you get your pedaling really quick so that you can deal with that during the race scenario. And 
make you more familiar with that and, and teach you some of the tactics and that kind of stuff so that you're a bit more competent when it comes to racing against others. Yeah, and so you're kind of border, bordering on that, uh, those two energy systems of going flat out but then holding on. Um, what is what is it like having quads and cars and just everything absolutely screaming at you? <laughs> Oh, it's just a, another day in my life. <laughs> it's a, it's kind of why I ride where I ride. You know, I'm third man for a reason, and that because and that's because I have I have this ability to hold on to that speed and to almost stop listening to my legs and and just get to the finish line by any means necessary. And a lot of guys will jam up and then just you can see it. It's just painful to watch. You just want to push them. You just want to push them to the finish line because it's turn from peeling circles into just like stomping away on the ground and there's bikes going all over the show. So for me, it's keeping the bike still and keep peeling the circles and and keeping the power on even when my legs don't want to do it. Yeah. Um, and so where do you think that ability comes from, mate? I think it's a mental thing, eh? Yeah. Like, people, like everyone can train to be strong and you can train to deal with that sort of pain, but like not a lot of people want to do that, you know? You see a lot of sprinters would want to do fast 200 or a fast standing lap because they're twitchy powerful exercises where there's not a lot of pain involved yeah but to train to be a third man in a team sprint or to do a kilo it's um it's a lot of grueling stuff to go through and i don't think people they just don't want to do it yeah you know there's a certain breed you know that have that mindset they just don't care nice. they, they want to do that they want to be the best at it regardless of what it does to them you know yeah, and you came came from junior junior world champs, is that right? Yeah, yeah. junior world champs in Mexico, Agros yeah. Calientes. Yeah. On an old concrete outdoor track. I got sick in there. And it sort of sort of um, set me on this path, you know, like as a kilo rider. Mainly mainly a kilo rider because there was very little sprint done in New Zealand. It was all teams to shoot, endurance stuff and on the road. And we didn't really have many sprinters, so we couldn't really, I couldn't develop as a sprinter until this program was put together. So the kilo was, an, it was a simple way of training. It was a hard way of training, but it's simple. It's like single mind, single minded. You just got to go as hard as you can for as long as you can. And you can train that very easily. But yeah, so that doing that kilo at, um, in Mexico sort of set me up to, to expand my, expand my um, horizons into other things like team swimming. And then river rent. Yeah. And how important do you think this Oceania setup is having those Aussies there to push you? Oh, it's cool, man. It's really cool. And they always bring they always bring it, you know, like well, as a as a country, New Zealand's got ten sprinters that are in that that world elite level. Australia's got ten, they ride for Australia and then they've got each state's got five, you know, so it's like it's huge and it's it's a big competition for us and it always gives us a gold standard for where we are compared to the rest of the world because the Australians are so competitive. Nice, mate. Um, what is one thing that's been coached to you that you hold on to um, throughout, throughout this career? Um, one thing that I've, I've learned that has stuck with me is like the ability and like the focus of riding the black line. Mm -hmm. So like, the shortest way home is to ride under the black line, and that's my goal. Sometimes I even sort of flirt with the blue band which is a bit sketchy sometimes but the ability to ride fast but also ride straight is, is a huge thing that a lot of people haven't grasped yet mm. and you see a lot of guys that are super quick but they're all over the all over the track and one thing that I feel like I hold as one of my cards on my sleeve is the ability to ride the perfect line every time. Yeah. Um, going back to the individual sprint, what was it like the first time you were on one of these steep tracks up the top? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was crazy. Um, and the first time I rode on a track like that was in Invercargill, yeah. which is cool. You know, it was cool. Uh, Valjean opened in 2006 and um, they had a big showcase and they got some Aussies over that rode, rode around and set track records. They weren't actually that quick now that I look back on it, but um, that's fine. Um, but uh, it was awesome, it was, but it was super daunting, you know, like, it was so high up and you go so much quicker on a, on a wooden track compared to a concrete track. So it was in a new, it was in a new element of speed and, and, and also the geometry of the track made it quite scary as well. But 
after a few times around it sort of that sort of dulls away and, and you just get down to it. Yeah, what's your worst crash? <laughs> I've had a couple. I've had a couple of bad crashes. Um, one of them's on YouTube. It's a crash in 2011 in Manchester in a Karen, and um, I was in second place coming into the finish line, and the Malaysian guy like fell on my back wheel and took out the whole field except for the guy that won, Chris Lloyd, brand new world champ. Yep. <laughs> and um, I skid up the track and I skidded to the bottom and I got up and I was like running my bike down the track. I'm pretty sure I was unconscious. But um, that was probably the biggest crash I've had, but also had one when I was in Russia and we're on this track in Tula, which is kind of like uh, kind of like the, the Huntley of Russia. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sorry, uh, Huntley. <laughs> yeah, sorry, mate. Um, but it's banked like an indoor track. Yeah. And as soon as you go into the straight, it goes to dead flat. So coming out of the corner and the track just disappeared. And, I, and a guy crashed in front of him and I, and, I, and I crashed over him. And I stood up and I had no shoes on. My skin suit was like completely ripped, like almost ripped off completely. No helmet, no glasses. And um, yeah, I was just blown away that I didn't get super smashed up from it. But um, it's one of those places where... Um, of a devastation like the next year like a girl actually passed away from a crash Jeez. at that track yeah so it's you know life on the line to race in this little town in the middle of russia yeah it's a pretty crazy sport and so how do you get back from from damaging yourself like that um just i don't know i've got a good team around us you know like all the boys and, and the staff and stuff are uh, really supportive and we get on to stuff really quickly you know whether you've got an injury or a niggle in the gym or like your hamstrings are tired or you you've got a problem with your bike set up, it all gets like sorted out really quickly, you know, and and we don't want to lose a day of training. We don't wanna but we don't want to rush back into things either. So if you need that time then, then they allow you to have that time. Nice mate. Uh, tell us a bit about your your tattoos, mate. What's what's going on with your Māori tattoos, bro? Um, well I got my Māori tattoo is actually my second tattoo that I ever got. I got my first tattoo was the Southern Cross on my side and I got it in the United States which was pretty funny and when they set the, the stencil up it was actually the Confederate flag I'm like that's not that's not the right Southern Cross <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad I looked at it before um, before I did it it would have been devastated but uh, the Māori tattoo is um, it represents my family and it has a has a story about my birth family and the family that I have now and, and hopefully it'll grow the tattoo will grow as I create my own family in the future. Nice, mate. Yeah. And what other things have you got on these? Um, I've got an eagle here. Um, it's actually for my primary school teacher, yes. Mrs. Anderson. Um, when I won, when I won um, silver in Rio, she actually sent me a card saying, "Here's some money to get a golden eagle tattoo," because she used to call me a golden eagle. So I went and got it. I think she was a bit blown away that I actually did it, but yeah. um, that's pretty cool. Um, I've got Jasmine's, eight Jasmine's on my arm because I live on Jasmine Place and I'm number eight, so I'm glad I don't live on like 26 Jasmine Place. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and actually this one here is, is quite a lot of significance as well because um, this is Swallow and um, for me it, it, it reminds me to always remember where home is and you know, where you come from and it's cool thing about it is me and my brother have the exact same tattoo so my mum wasn't super happy about my brother getting a tattoo but it's a bit late for her to be angry about me yeah yeah nice, nice mate um and so you live here in cambridge with with your wife what was what was it like getting married man oh it was, it was extreme mate it was a stressful day um no nah, that's cool it was, everything was organized um my parents and and alicia's parents just know that you know like I'm a bit of a headless chicken when it comes to this stuff like that. So, um, no, it was a perfect day. It was the one one good weather day in the two weeks that we were in Monaco, and, and um, no, it was the best day of my life so far. Hopefully, birth of my first child will be, will supersede that, but maybe not. Yeah. But it's uh, yeah, no, it was it was an awesome day. It was really awesome. That was awesome to see, mate. Um, when you hear the word successful, who do you think of, and why? Who do I think of when I hear the word successful? Uh, I think of my dad. You know, he's a he's a hard man and he's a he's a hard worker and he did a lot of stuff on his own. You know, and 
Let's build a bit of a legal empire in, <laughs> in South and that's that probably would take over New Zealand if it could, you know, and um he's he's the hardest worker I know. He's he's up before anybody's up and he doesn't go to sleep until he's got his work done, you know, so he's works super long hours and but he also has time time for time for my mum and time for our family, you know, and has always been there and been there to support us through different sporting endeavours and, and all that kind of stuff and yeah, success, yeah. He's and he's forever chasing it as well, you know. Like he never actually considers himself successful because he hasn't finished yet. Nice. And he'll probably never finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's big big dork senior. Yeah, <laughs> the original dork. Yeah, that's the one. Um what are some of your morning routines? So what is the first sixty minutes of your day look like? First sixty minutes I wake up. How many coffees? How many coffees? <laughs> I have a lot. I have a lot of coffees. Um I wake up, um, the coffee machine's on all the time, twenty four seven. So I wake up, boom, first coffee down. Um, rock of coffee beans, obviously. Um, and yeah, I sometimes for the gym that's all I have. Yep. I don't eat a lot of food before the gym. I feel a little bit like groggy and gluggy and stuff. So I might have a protein shake or something, but it has to be within like a certain amount of time out from the gym. Um, but yeah, in the first 60 minutes, I'll, I'll have probably two coffees, which is a bit much probably, but two coffees and breakfast on a day like today, nice, um, relaxing Sunday. So, but yeah, it's, yeah, coffee is definitely a big part of, of my morning ritual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what happens for the mindset in your self talk before going into a race? Um, well, it's developed a lot over the last 10 years. In the beginning, it was just like... Just kill everyone, you know. Like <laughs> it was aggressive, and it was like system of a down, and Metallica and my headphones, and it was as loud as it could go, and it was deafening. And the mindset, and everyone had this mindset of just being super amped up, you know, and like being super excitable and being excited is it turns to anxiety like really quickly. Yeah. And if you get too pumped up, then you you just automatically you know, perform on shops because you start to question everything, you start to get nervous, and you know. So if now it's, it's, well, I've been to the biggest stages that is, there ever will be, you know, so I, races outside of the Olympics are so much more chilled out, you know, and, and I know that I'm there to do a job and I'm there to execute these five things. And if I do these five things and the boys do their five things, then we'll be world champions again, you know, and, and it's just as simple as that. So it's less, there's less uh, mental energy spent on thinking about it. I just know that this is what I've got to do. Yeah. Um, how far out are you planning your training? Um, we've got training pro uh, programs sorted until Com Games, which is six months away, or nearly six months away, and um, I'm sure there's a four year plan, you know, like. But it's um for us, we sort of get our training like month by month, which gives us an opportunity to question question stuff and organize other things like um, like sponsorship requirements and that kind of stuff around that so we can also I get I spend a lot of time going back down south to see my family and, and that and it's good to to do that you know it's important for me to be to be close to them and if I can get back down and organize my training so that I can train down there as well it's it helps a lot but I think yeah so it's sort of like a month out we get get a um, get our training yeah nice. Um, and just on the family, you've done some work with our sons in New Zealand. What, what, why do you, do you give back it, and, and why in that format? Um, well, it's it's sort of it's it's affected my family, both sides of my family, yeah. um, a lot over the last sort of like five years, six years, and um, I wanted to do something to help raise awareness. So I did um, the first thing that I that I did was I did a motorcycle rally with my coach around the North Island. So. We went um, southern Auckland and went down out to um, Fakatani and then down through to Taupo and yeah, it was cool to like do that because that was sort of my first introduction to Harley Davidson as well. I actually got my full license the day before. Nice. I would have had to run a run a little bike, which wouldn't have been <laughs> nice. But um, so did that and then the following year we did a um, an activation called Undercuts for Alzheimer's and I got my friend Dave Woody from Nimbus Media to help. Um, with 
the promotion of their van and they've got um, a barber shop in, in Hamilton to come along and do free haircuts and all the money went to Alzheimer's and, and the tattoo shop and Hamilton Body Art came along and did the tattoo as well and the same thing happened like all the proceeds went to Alzheimer's so it was cool, really cool. Different way of looking at fundraising, you know, like there was a bit more pressure than that. Mo Rock as well has uh, helped you raise awareness for men's health last year. What, yeah. How, how was that cruise down with uh, with Jay Reed? No, <laughs> oh, he's a nutcase. But, no, it's cool. It was it was awesome. Mate. I went to a few um, Harley Davidson dealerships and did the the nights and talked about men's health. And for me, I'm the youngest out of those lot, out of Jay and um, Josh Confound and that. So like, men's health is it's important to start that stuff early. You know, like get onto the onto the prostate exams and all that kind of stuff to make sure you're healthy for the future because down the track it could be a little bit too late, you know, so. Um, but it was cool, you know, really lighthearted guys. I love having a good yarn and um, no, I'm all keen to do another one in the near future. A lot of bikes, eh? Yeah, yeah, man. Do you have any quotes that you live by or, or refer to at all? Um, quotes to live by? Um, I have a tattoo on my forearm. Yeah. That was a saying that my dad and his brother used to say a lot, and it's nil desperandum, which is part of a bigger, a bigger phrase, nil desperandum, nil carborundum, which means never despair, never, never um, let them get you down. And for me, it was a big thing when, from crashing or from losing a race or not doing so well on a exam or all that kind of stuff is. You know, never, like you can always, you can always. There's always something else. There's always something like the next thing. You know, you got to forget that in the past and move on to the next thing. And the other, the other thing I have is a tattoo on my back actually that says, um, "There is not to make reply. There is not to reason why. There is but to do and die," which is part of a poem called "The Charge of the Light Brigade." And, and for me, it is to follow. To follow the leadership of our program and to follow, like my heart and in, into scenarios and, and to just do it with with um you know full force you know like give it everything and and not even think about the negative outcome not not even think of what if or what could happen it's you know, going in there with one mindset and this is how we're going to react and this is how we're going to act and and the result will be the result. Nice mate. Uh, just to finish off, what's some something that you've changed your mind about? over the last year and, and why do you think you've changed your mind on it? Do you have anything there? Oh, what have <laughs> I changed my mind on? Actually, probably the road stuff, you know, like me, I don't know, I was I was in that group, the lazy sprinter group for many, <laughs> many years and I didn't like the road and I didn't enjoy doing road rides. I thought it was boring and I, and I just hated it, you know, and I would avoid it at all costs. But uh, once being in this program, and especially over the last couple of years, that is that has definitely changed. You know, I really enjoy getting out on the road, and and it's funny because I I don't even know why I was so pissed off. You know, why I was so annoyed about going out on the road. Now that I think about it, and it's cool, but I still find it quite hard to ride on my own. You know, like having headphones in, that's fine. But if you're going to do a couple of hours or three hours, you're going to have to have some mates up there because <laughs> there's only so much time you can talk to yourself. You know. Yeah, yeah, and uh, after the Olympics, the, you did a little bit of road riding over in the states. Tell, yeah, tell us about where you were and what that experience was like. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, when I went to the states for the first time in two thousand and eight, I did a lot of criteriums and yeah. stuff. We just did everything. We tried to do as many races as we could. We weren't very good, you know. <laughs> overweight and and ambitious is probably probably the cliff notes of that of that trip, but um. This year I got the opportunity to have a bit of free reign and go and do do some different stuff. And I just got married and, and me and my wife were over there racing together. And I had the opportunity to race some of these road rides, road, road races. And I raced in some crazy places. Like I raced around Central Park, you know, and I raced um, like in the back streets of New York and, and, and in New Jersey and stuff. And it was awesome, mate. I loved it. It was, um, it was real eye-opener, and, but it also... Um, took me back, you know, to when I was younger where I mean track wasn't such a wasn't so serious, you know. Yeah. It's serious now and that's because it has to be and and I wouldn't have it any other way, but 
getting back to racing on the road is it's quite it's we haven't we haven't really had the opportunity to do that and fair enough with with the events that have been going on and stuff that it's probably not the best thing to risk crashing on the road with the, the 80 other guys you know but it's, it was cool that they gave me the opportunity to go and do that nice mate and so what are the channels that they find G Dawkins on if they want to contact you or see what you're up to or follow your journey which obviously it's not over. No, it's never over. It's never <laughs> done. Um, probably Instagram, uh, Big Dorco One. Okay. Um, Eddie Dawkins on Facebook and Eddie Dawkins on Twitter. I don't really use Twitter too much. I think the last thing I put up was just a picture of a hamburger or something. <laughs> Not even a picture, just a, like an emoji of a hamburger. But um, yeah, if you want to have a chat, just flick me a message. I'm, I'm sure I'll reply back to you and um, yeah. give you my best best feedback on whatever you ask. And then the Dawkins performance. Oh yeah, we've also got yeah Dawkins performance Dawkins underscore performance on Instagram and it's also on Facebook as well. And that shows the journey of, of some of the guys that we have here training and um, giveaways of bottles and t-shirts and stuff like that as well. Nice mate, thanks very much for coming on. Awesome to right. speak. Appreciate Cheers. it. Cheers mate.